Welcome to a scrap life. No suits required. Just guts and hard work. Here is your host, Brett Eckhart. All right. So I've been wanting to get this uh, podcast on the books for a while. <laughs> You're a busy guy, obviously. Um, I'm busy. And so us trying to link up and get uh, get it done is... We, but we finally got it. I'm like, all right, yeah. fuck it. I'm just going to fly to New York. I know. It's cool that you flew. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so that's pretty neat. So here it is. So I got my, uh, my guy, Nick, with me. And I just want to open up the podcast um, maybe in like a unique way and tell kind of a story about why, why I even want to do the podcast with you, right? So in about two, from about 2000, say, 10, 11 to about 15... I was like a voracious AMM reader, right? Yeah. I was always reading AMM. I've been in the scrap business. I'm third generation, right? My grandfather started it, then my dad, then myself. Um, and I was, we we're at the time, we were partners with Schnitzer Steel. Right. A publicly traded, you know, monstrosity of a company, right? Um, a lot of good memories, a lot of tough times, but it is what it is. So I'm sitting there watching, reading AMM, and I'm reading about the stories about this guy. Adam Weitzman, who's like, who's making moves, like you're you, at, from about, and I kind of ran through the history, probably from about say ten to maybe nine to fifteen. You were like, you were, you had done a lot of expansion. Is yeah, that about from like two thousand nine to two thousand. Yeah, yeah, I did like acquisitions. Yeah, and you were like you, you were really like going hard, and it, and in that time we had a couple good years, and then fourteen and fifteen started to get really tough, like yeah. in the scrap business, right? Yeah. So, I was kind of felt like I was boxed in by Schnitzer, right? And I was like, "Fuck! I just, I like, I want to be able to do this. I want to be able to do that." And my dad was, you know, he was tired of being partners with Schnitzer. He was like on his way out, and so I was reading what you were doing, and I was like, "Schnitzer gave us an opportunity to buy him out in 2015, right?" right. And I, you know, it was a pretty risky decision at that time. The market was shit, but I was like, "Screw it." Are right. going to do it, right? Retired my dad, bought Schnitzer out in 15, oh, and yeah, then 16 yeah. it went. But one of the th- reasons why I was I felt good enough and I felt comfortable enough to do it is I was watching you make a bunch of moves like for years, right? So you were kind of in a roundabout way, and I was telling this to Nick yesterday. You're kind of an inspiration for me That's to really do cool. what I did. Yeah, I'm glad and you've done so well. So, so now you're killing. It. I just so want you to, to know, it. like. To start the podcast, like it's my way of saying, like, you kind of maybe you didn't know, and there's probably a lot of guys out there, out there like me, but you were kind of inspiring to like take some risk and like make it happen. No, I appreciate that. So, that's a good story. I like just it. Just so you know, like that's where I'm at. We bought them out, and now we're family owned. I retired my parents. Yeah, it's, it's just me and a bunch of my friends, and, and we run the business. Yeah, that's really cool. So, it's a good story for the day. Now, your story. Give me just a little bit of background, you, where you grew up, you know, what, uh, you know, did you, where are you from, and yeah. just a little bit of the history of you, and, uh, you know, maybe, and, and when I say history, I mean, like, you know, your grandfather, your father, it's sure. you, and then we'll kind of work through the rest. Yeah, so, um, I started in this business, um, I was in New York City, um, I never really grew up in the scrap business, um, Okay. It was just it was my dad and my grandfather. Uh, they had a small retail operation about like ten miles from here, maybe five miles from here. Uh, that's where my dad grew up and my grandfather grew up. And uh, 1938. Yeah, 1938. So yeah. they were like really you know hard workers, good guys, and everything. And um, went to school for fine arts. Uh, opened an art gallery in New York City. Really was loving life there and mm-hmm. enjoying it. it. Wasn't making any money there, but it was enough. I had led a pretty like bohemian life there, so I yeah. didn't really need much. So, um, when you're young, like how old were you at that time? I was like uh, 20. When you're 20 and you're young, like you don't need a, a lot if you're really loving what you're doing, right? Yeah, so it was the best. Kinda... It was like the best times there. Yeah. So, um, so then my, uh, yes, I never like grew up in the business. Like, uh-huh. you know, I'd come like hang out with my dad, but I didn't really get involved too much with the business. And then um, years later, my sister had passed away unexpectedly from cancer. Um, you know, my dad got really depressed and bummed out over it, likely so, because they were, like, you know, inseparable, the two yeah. of them, and my mom, too. Mm-hmm. And uh, I came back to help my dad for a summer. Okay. Uh, 
and uh, I had my gallery was a tiny gallery, so I just had interns like run it, uh -huh. so it could like sort of function on. So I'd go back down on the weekends, and then um, so I worked here for a while. Didn't really know what I was doing, and um, so what year did you come back to work? I um, think here? came back in uh, in the early '90s. Okay, I think it was the early '90s was when I came back. I've been doing this now for. Uh, 30 years yeah I think, something isn't like that, that crazy to think that the early 90s is 30 years yeah it goes by really fast <laughs> and everything but I, I came into the business um you know my dad um I, I i wanted to do the shredding business the only reason is is um his business was you know getting attacked by a local shredder yeah you know i didn't want to see my dad get beat up so i figured out a way to borrow all this money um he didn't really want to do the shredder at all so it was a separate entity so I borrowed all the money from the local banks and uh, I figured out there was a program here that I only had to put up a little tiny money to build this place. Okay. Uh, and then I got destroyed. Um, the market, right? The market. The market. So, uh, I mean, I can use the market as an excuse because the market, yeah. that's when Shred went to $75 a ton uh -huh. and then Timken rejected it back yeah. or something like that. <laughs> but um, uh, it was, uh, I really didn't know what I was doing and I was just like, I was just like really like, um, it was just a bad scene, yeah. you know. So, um, used up my line of credit, built this gigantic inventory pile. I don't. It might have been a hundred thousand tons, which for me that was monstrous. It was everywhere, yeah. piled up, yeah. and then the market just tanked out. Then I couldn't get the thing running, and then the company, um, I had bought a new old shredder, and then they went bankrupt in between the deliveries. And that would be ninety six. Yeah, I think six, around there. Yeah. I'm not that great on dates, but around yeah, there. Yeah, in so, that range. So Shredder's half bill, I sent all my money to them. Uh, I never got the rest of the Shredder. Yeah. Um, it never you know, operated and then the motors didn't work and it was just, um, it was a shit show of epic proportions. So uh, I did this thing where I illegally transferred funds uh, between two accounts uh, to, I was just sort of buying time to the Shredder ran. Luckily, thank God, none of the banks lost any money, but I got arrested. Went to prison for a year, um, which wasn't too fun. Ruined my reputation. Um, I deserved to go to prison. I mean, I broke the law. Yeah. I, I mean, I didn't ever expect it to. I thought I, I did it one day because each day I thought the shredder was going to run, and it was just a disaster. Um, and it didn't. It wouldn't run for like six months, and then the market tanked. But it started out as like a one day thing. I'm like, well, I'll just write this check over here, and then just to keep everything. Yeah. When you're to, in that moment when you're just trying to keep things moving, and I think it happens a lot with startups in general like like even today's tech startups they're just you know they're either going and get money to try yeah. to keep things moving at whatever cost it takes right just to try and get over that hump yeah. to where they can get square and i had no access to more money because my lines were tapped out everything mm -hmm. was tapped to the to the extreme and i couldn't do anything with the product here because there's, there's really no i didn't want to sell to the the one local yeah. guy the guy and, you uh, want to compete against yeah but. so i just uh bit the bullet and um I was really proud because I never filed bankruptcy. I ended up, you know, paying the banks back. I still use the same banks today, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And then I, after I went to jail for the banks, yeah. the banks never, luckily because they never lost any money, they didn't close the accounts or anything like that. Uh -huh. um, so uh, made it through, paid everybody back. Everybody was very um, kind, you know, to, to work it out with me. So I just didn't want to stiff anybody. Yeah. The accountants were like, and the attorneys like, oh, file bankruptcy, get out of this thing. But I, I just... I knew if I paid people late and I just kept calling them all the time, uh -huh. hopefully they would, you know, down the road, maybe, you know, you like if somebody doesn't pay you a dollar, you don't remember your whole life. Yeah. But if somebody pays you a slow $10, you don't really remember that. Exactly, yeah. So um, I, I paid everybody off, paid the banks off, and uh, luckily the banks uh, had st stuck by me till even today. It feels like a karma thing, right? Like I... Like, I don't, I don't, I don't pretend to know a ton about you, but I feel like you kind of, you have, a, you, you place a lot of um, energy and karma, like doing good and, and doing the right thing. And eventually like, it kind of comes back around, right? It feels like that is kind of part of that. I think now that I'm older, it is. But when I was younger, all I cared about was myself. Yeah, but as far as not paying the banks, like not filing bankruptcy, like <sighs> I think, did, or are you just trying to? be able to kind of get it back over the hump once you got back to operate or was it just I mean it was it was tempting but in the end I just didn't want to do it okay. you know, I just didn't want to do it so back then it wasn't a karma thing today okay. like I'm trying to do good stuff and 
rebuild my reputation and stuff like that. But back then, I only cared about what was good for me. So I probably my karma is the one that got me into the spot. Yeah. So my what bad is, karma probably yeah. was what got me into the spot of going to prison, losing my reputation. You know, my poor dad, he had a small company and like, he's at a, like a little peddler yard and his reputation got hurt because of me. Yeah. But I can say here, like he had nothing to do with, Yeah. he didn't have anything to do with any of this stuff. It was. And it anytime was I've ever heard that story or versions of that story, you know, like, you know, from different outlets, it's always the same. Like, it was me, it was me, it was me doing this. Like, yeah, there was nobody else involved. Like, and you've always taken it like square on the chin and said, this is my deal. Like, well, it's part of the story. You can't, like, I'm not here to give, like, some puff piece. No. I mean, this is, and like, I, I wouldn't do, like, I wouldn't send a PR, like, yeah. like, oh, everything's great. I love the scrap business. I just love this. Not, you know, yeah. you're younger. I don't love the scrap business as much as you do. <laughs> but I love what the scrap business allows me to do. Uh-huh. Do I have a passion for the scrap business? Not as much. I see, like, I read all your stuff, and I'm, yeah. I'm a big fan. I follow everything you do. But you have that, that, that fire in you for the scrap business. Me, I, I don't have that same fire. I can work a 100-hour week because yeah. I don't sleep, so I can sleep a three-hour day. So uh-huh. I can, like, out... In the industry, you know, a lot of people, like, have negative things to say, and there's a lot of haters, and that's okay because it's free speech, and yep. I get it. But nobody's out there saying I didn't. I don't work hard. No, I... Even I, my I enemies know... Even know my enemies that. know I fucking work like yeah. a dog here. Uh-huh. But I'm a weird guy, and I get it. Like, I always heard, like, I had partners, like... I never had a partner, this, other than the bank, the local bank, but people like, if I sell something to Sims, I'm like, oh, Sims is your partner, or uh-huh. if I sell something, if I go to dinner with Herbie Black in Canada, they're like, oh, Herbie's his partner, yeah. Triple M's his partner, Schnitzer, EMR, but no, I've never had a dollar outside of the local banks invest in this, in the, invest in this company, but it makes good, like, it makes good, there's not much exciting stuff to talk about in the scrap business. Exactly, so. it's, it's, you know, other than the price swings, right? Like, that's yeah. what you get to talk about. So, so I, that's when they, I think people use the gossip thing to sort of, like, 100%. make this shit a little yeah. more exciting. Oh, I, 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 yeah, there's no doubt, there's no doubt in my mind. So give me the, because I'm third generation, you're third generation, obviously. Um, how did the, in 2005, was the transition from when you bought your uh, dad out? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So... Because there's a lot of scrap is kind of known for being kind of a multi generational business, and a lot of a lot of businesses don't ever make it to the third generation, right? right? So what, what did that transition look like for you from your dad? Was it an easy just hey I'm buy you out like I want you to go retire? And is what kind of advice would you give somebody that's like looking to like make that transition? Because I mean I I know what I would tell them. But this isn't about me. I, I'm just kind of curious. Like you've been through that third generation transition. Was it just an easy, simple deal? Was it? It was a small. It was a really, really small company with not multiple locations. So it was a. It was a pretty simple deal. Okay. Um, my dad was really great, you know, and like we're really close today. We weren't close like back then. Yeah. But now it's like because business isn't part of the conversation anymore. Because when he retired, he retired cold turkey. Yeah. Like and. Uh, I don't blame him. He should enjoy life. He worked. His, he worked really hard. So there's nobody happier that he's enjoying life than me. Than you. But the transition, he was great. In the beginning, like there's some things I did that I think um, he questioned. And some of the stuff, some of his probably advice I should have taken because I made mistakes along the way for uh-huh. sure. Yeah. So I definitely will give him credit that a lot of the stuff he told me. Um, but you're younger, you're not really thinking about listening to your dad and stuff like that. When but, you get older, isn't it crazy how that advice that your dad gave you like kind of comes back around? You're like, oh, I see what you were talking about. Like, yeah, his yeah. stuff is very basic advice. And so, I mean, I just was trying to make this a lot of more complex than it really should be. Scrap industry is pretty basic. I do the same stuff every day. Yeah. I just try to raise the bar each day. It doesn't matter, like, you know, if you have 50 employees, you have 800 employees. It doesn't matter. It's the same stuff, just another zero. Yeah, for sure. I mean, no, I mean, it makes 100% sense. And I'll come back to that because I, I got a point on that um, with you. So, like, uh, I was just going through, like, I was going through your website and, and just kind of going through the progression. And so, in 96, 7 is when you kind of went, went about putting the first shredder in. And then when you came in and put the big boy that you have today. Yeah. You know, that was kind of the game changer. Yeah, it's a big, it's, it's a big shredder, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's 10,000 horse, right? 9,000 9, horse, 9, horse. Yeah. horse. It's a 122 inch mill, so it's a pretty big size mill. You know, you got 1,000 pound hammers going in there, so it's yeah. a big mill. And, you know, I did the feeder yard system around it to feed the mill. 
and you know feeder yards there's pluses and minuses i'm not so pro feeder yard anymore i'm more investing in trucks and transportation that's what was like i i so i was that was my next question for you you you, you're beating me the you're beating me the question but but you're 100 percent correct i was I was looking at, you know, the progression and you, you know, you, you have, you bought the big mill and so then you started, you try to figure out how to feed it efficiently. So that's, that's kind of when your acquisitions and everything started really yeah. kind of, and the purpose of those was to help feed, feed this. Your yeah. Share. Okay. And some of them were good acquisitions. Some were okay. Uh-huh. You know, um, but like anything, you have to have a pretty big geographical area to really make them work. Yeah. The small town ones are tough. Yeah. You, you run on a much larger scale than we do. But, you know, we have to cover, you know, say 600 miles to, to yeah. feed, you know, and, and trucking and transportation is such a huge component of it for us. And I've seen your investments in your trucks and the, and the end yeah. dumps and the... Trucking is our biggest expense. Yeah. You know, that was a big risk. I was a little nervous on the trucking thing. You know, um, some people are like, no, I don't think you should do the trucking because I don't really want to be in the trucking industry. Yeah. But, you know, we're running like 250 trucks now, which is a lot of trucks company wide. So what was the tipping point that made you say, okay, maybe it's not necessarily as big of a feeder yard issue as it's a transportation. I couldn't get the feeder yards were loaded with inventory. I couldn't get any independent, the independent truckers sort of started, they're not really hauling scrap. Scrap is the last thing they want. You know, steel trailers are heavy. There's so many different reasons, wait times at yards to load. So I wanted to be in control of my own destiny and cash flow. Um, So now I can move a lot of scrap. uh, When you want to. Yeah, we can move 3,000 ton a day by truck. Yeah, so it's a Which lot. Which is a lot of yeah, scrap by, by truck. truck. It is, yeah, yeah. People three thousand ton a day. When you have rail and ship and barge, it's you know. But when you start and you start really start doing the math and say, okay, how, can I move three thousand ton a day by truck? Yeah, you start it's figuring tough. out how many trucks that is, how many trailers that is, how many drivers that is, and miles and fuel and it's a lot. But it's a yeah. big, it's a big undertaking. It's a big expense. I'd say most of my debt is transportation. Yeah, you know, um, you know, borrowed money from the. They have such good interest rates. Like some of it was like two percent, like one point nine percent. You know, uh, through Daimler and things like that for like Freightliner, Western Star. Yeah. Um, so, My, you know, put an investment in the trucks. Then the find the drivers. The 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 rates have gone up so much in the past two years. Like, the you know the rate of pay oh, for the yeah. drivers, the fuel. So, it's an expensive proposition. The trailers are so expensive now, but. We had to have it, and um, so most of my growth, I'm buying trailers and trucks every single month, building mm-hmm. the fleet every month. So instead of doing feeder yards and have to deal with, you know, theft and environmental, I'm just I'm just really more partnering with other yards. Uh, you know, front them cash, front them equipment, help them, and let them operate it, and then I buy the scrap. Then you, yeah, and then if and then because it's such a big deal for most yards to be able to handle their transport, if yeah, you can, I then can truck it for them too. Provide that freight movement for yeah. them their ability to keep them, you know, in the ability to buy it and cash flow their inventory and you can move it for them. Like that's kind of a win-win scenario without necessarily having to take ownership of the yard. Because I will say, you know, I mean, I drove around briefly and after this, I'm going to go do the tour um, because I'm a junkie. Like I I, want to, any scrapyard I'm around, I want to go do, I want to go walk. But um, it's a tight ass ship. Like, yeah, we, we, this is a, and that's why some people don't like it's, you know, we've had some turnover with managers here because yeah. I'm really OCD. I really care about how the place looks, and some people just don't have that same uh, same mentality. same mentality, same vision. So, is this the easiest place to work? I don't know. I mean, not, a little easier now that I'm older, but I still want things. I want it broom clean. I want yeah. everything painted. I want every dent fixed. I want the equipment to look new. And it's my legacy. It's you know, it's what. You know, I want my daughter to take over next. You know, that's why I didn't want to sell the companies because I want my. She's and when you 13. go buy a feeder yard, and you want it to look a certain way, that's a big capital investment up front. Not only just the purchase, right? Because you want it to it's reflect your legacy, reflect what Upstate Shredding is. Yeah, but the input, but plus, usually when you're going to and you buy a new yard, then the old guard is not used to running it that way, uh-huh. and they lose their shit. <laughs> <laughs> they do. They just like this guy's are crazy. Yeah. You know, uh, they're like saying this is the worst place ever. And then you lose a lot of the staff, and then you lose those local relationships. So it's best that I stay out of it. Yeah. And I'll just send nice shiny trucks to other people's yeah. cars. So. I like it. So my dad, real quick, one last thing on that. So my dad told me years and years ago. He's like, son, control the transport. So we have a trucking company, right? Yeah. See, he's like, the trucks are beautiful. Yeah. I've seen he's their like, trucks. Control 
your destiny by controlling the transportation, right? So he was a big truck guy. Yeah. I was always like, why are we spending so much fucking money on trucks? Like I was like you though. No, but I, I was sort of me, like right? I was sort of like in your in your camp, but I couldn't afford to ever sit here. And I've always had the fear, even though like financially company's really strong now, but back in the day when I was like teetering, yeah. Like I have the fear of not being able to move things and cash flow is very important in this game especially now commodity prices are high yeah look at cash flow like we've raised prices on everything you know aluminum is because if you don't you don't get it you don't buy it right but but the margins there but you're putting the cash outlay Mm -hmm. the cash outlays is going to be a lot bigger now it's only going to get bigger because this thing i don't know we'll see which creates another barrier of entry like for the next guy that wants to come and put a yard and all of a sudden like i tell people i'm like if you want to get in the scrap business please believe it's it's not about, you know, what kind of equipment you have on the ground or whatever else. It's about the people that can run the equipment. And you better have enough money to buy scrap, especially when you have the pricing you have today. Because, I mean, it goes quick. Yeah, the cash burn is way different. Anybody, like, the equipment's the easy part. Yeah. Anybody can get, with a UCC from a bank, a bank will loan anybody, if you have decent credit, for equipment's the easiest thing to finance. 100%. So it's not that, but what you're saying is the cash burn from that startup. Yeah. And that's what killed me back in the first shredding day. Yeah, like all the way back to that. To, yeah. to that. So I should have never been buying inventory until I had it running. That was a big mistake. But you know, it's, at that point, you're just trying to get yourself in a position that you can hit the ground running. Yeah, but uh, you're also overpaying. You're buying shitty scrap. Yeah, just, lessons learned. I'll chalk that one up. Like, that goes. That's going to go back to later uh, to a lesson, a good lesson learned. So I love that you advertise that you're the largest privately owned. Um, uh, scrap processing company on the east coast right because yeah, i'm a dinosaur have, I'm, one of the few, I'm, I'm like a dinosaur i'm one of the only ones yeah left, that's what i was know? gonna say so, so you really you have a bunch of publicly traded like large corporations you're here competing against every day yeah and they're getting what? smarter they, you know the public companies people can say whatever they want they're getting smarter by the day and they're better run and uh what is I'm your strategic by... strategic advantage um that i can answer decisions quicker than a public company that's all that's I mean, it. they have the R and D. They have so much. Um, there's, they have so much great locations. That, you know, the public companies. There's access to capital. Very simple. Yeah. But just the brain trust that some of these places have is pretty good. Yeah. You know, but um, a speed and agility is, I think, my only strength. Speed wins. Yeah, yeah. it does. But but there's some there's some benefits of that. the R and D. The R and D of some of the the non ferrous equipment that these guys have early. It, it's a it's a game changer what they're doing, and they used to run not so small, but each year they're I think they adjust and, and they get smarter, and that's why you got to raise guys like us that are private. We have to keep raising the bar on what we're doing because the public companies are. Yeah, yeah, everybody like shit talks to public companies, but no, not not today. These guys, Sims, pretty well run company, you yeah. know, Schnitzer, well run company, uh, EMR, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, the owner of EMR. You know, those shepherds, they know what they're doing. I mean, these people, sure. Herbie Black up in Canada, guy's brilliant. Guy's like eight years old and yeah. he works like he's 20, you know. But he's, that's that's a that's not necessarily a public, like he's, like he's kind not of. Not a public me. company, I, but, but, he's, like, but well, he's an operator kind of like you, right? Yeah, but he's way that. smarter. I mean, that guy is like, <laughs> no, but like, but I, I cheat because I copy what he does. Like, because he's like, he's a, he's a guy that, you know, usually does it first, you know, and the guy has a work ethic second to none and, you know. Uh, you know, I'm not saying we're like close, lovey-dovey friends, but I, I respect. Even though he's my competitor, I respect him. I mean, look at look at what the guy's done up there. Oh man, it's... Triple M, they're they're killing it up there. Yeah, really well-run company. So, between all those companies, you know, and, and then you have some, you know, look at the guy Alter Trading, brilliant out there. Mm-hmm. Rob Goldstein and his group out there, like really smart. And, yeah. Uh, smart, and Jay, smart Jay Rabinovitz was an extensor guy. Yep, Jay. Yep. And Jay yep. runs that whole show up there. Yeah. And you know, he was a uh, smart. He was a smart guy. Look what Ad, George Adams is doing. I mean, guy. I mean, these guys run great operations. So it's yeah. you have some really great uh, companies. Some public, some not. That uh, you know, it keeps it keeps pushing. You to have to stay on your A game because these guys are on their A game. Are your is your goal to keep it? I mean, obviously, you said you want your daughter to. Um, come in run the show so your goal is to keep it private as yeah i'm not gonna sell possible, i'm not gonna sell right? the company i mean it's a big company now i mean yeah we, we do it's this is a we do a big tons here and it's a big volume company with the trucks and everything but i don't know i just I, i'd love to take it over i got some time i'm yeah. still here kicking away so and, yeah um, i just don't i just don't 
I never really even think about it. You know, we get calls from people, especially now, because it's funny how the scrap industry, either you're in vogue, uh-huh. or yeah. you're dog shit. Yeah, yeah. So now we're sexy again. <laughs> yeah. Next year we'll be dog shit. So uh-huh. when we're sexy, people call. Next year, nobody will be called. So. What, did I, what did I, I posted a deal this morning. It was basically got like a, you're like toilet paper. You're either on a roll or you're, you know, you're shit. And Dude, that's so you got shit in your face, right? That is, like, really, that is like, really true. Like, that's what it is, and that's uh, the scrap. Either you're yeah. like... Now people are like, if I go, if I ask people, like, they're like, oh, what do you do? You're like, you're the scrap. It's like, ooh, wow. And then like a year ago, they're like, ooh. Oh, yeah. you know, like, oh, yeah. you didn't excel at anything else, I guess. You know, so it's like Get one of those things. Fitting. So now everybody thinks it's uh, glamorous and, uh, and amazing. But So you mentioned earlier about like how your leadership style has changed, like versus, you know, what it was when you were younger to today. Yeah. And so what is that? Like, what's the, like, what's the change that you've, um, that you I mean, see in yourself just taking better the care of the people that work here I think is a big thing you know I'm still a bear to work for Let's, don't get me wrong you're like a lot nicer guy <laughs> I don't so know people that, yeah. love you compared here I, I don't socialize too much with the staff you know in uh-huh. this day and age you know I just I, they don't want you know they don't like I don't go out with the staff or anything probably the last thing they'd want is me to show yeah. up to some like you know, if I if they ask me to go out or something like that, I'll re- politely pass and call up the restaurant and buy them all dinner or yeah. whatever, or pay for the night. But I think after they leave here, the last person they want to see, see, they probably want to see the IRS. Yeah. Than me, you know? so, no, I'm not hanging out with the staff. So I think, um, you know, just to try to find out what people want. Not everybody's driven by the same thing. And um, give people an opportunity and to keep reinvesting in the business. I, I put a lot of money back in this business. So, yeah. Um, and that's evident. Like, yeah, it's it's, it's pretty good, but it's it's just, yeah, I keep always reinvesting. Like, our CapEx here is monstrous here. Yeah. And, um, I don't know, there's always going to be, you know, we the whole idea is to stay relevant. And, you know, everybody thinks there's some secret thing that we have here that we've been able to do stuff for, like, secret partners or secret this. Or, it's, it's just really no, the secret is I don't sleep, you know. Yeah. And that's the only way I've been able to survive is just to, to work like crazy hours. And I've had some people here that have really put in the time with me, so I'm very thankful. Do you, going back to the CapEx. Whoa, that's a big explosion. That's a good, a good one. one. <laughs> no. That's a good one. Keep that one that's on. A good, that's a that good one. That's real world. Yeah, that's a good one. Everybody's okay, though. Yeah. That's good. Okay. I hear I'm already saying everybody's okay. So, you uh, basically, from a budgetary standpoint, when you talk about CapEx, do you budget at the beginning of the year, like what you're going to spend from equipment? I mean, I know you have maybe you're an more idea. quarterly. Quarterly. Yeah. So somebody asked me about that the other day, and I and I said I don't, because I, I don't know what. If you tell me on January first how it's going to look on December thirty first, then I then you're hired because in, in this in our business because we're in the commodity business, I mean, you don't know really. I mean, you can anticipate, hope, you know, it's going to go a certain way, but. You know, you could get to July and it's going to be, it looks like a banner year. And then the last six months, you know, you're trying to keep the lights on, right? Yeah. And so I don't, I'm not a big budgeter because I feel like it's a waste of time. Um, it does because this is definitely a moving target. It's such industry. a movie, it's and hard. I've had this conversation with, with, with our CFO and him and I are on the same page. I'm like, trust me, like if we feel like there's an opportunity to grow, to do, like to invest, like this, I'm going to put it in. Like yeah. I'm putting it back in. Like, yeah, I agree. You know? I feel like that's a similar, you know, kind of touching base back on what you just said. That that's a very similar concept that you're doing here. The money you're generating, you're, you know, you're putting it back to work. It's a little easier now because I have a really great finance team. In yeah. the old days, it was me, the finance team, yeah. and um, <laughs> you know, I should you need help, right? So yeah, I definitely need help. needed help Trust on the me. finance team. So uh, I have a really amazing team, of financial guys here with the CFO and CEO and stuff like that. So they definitely. Uh, I get a, a live snapshot, a snapshot of where we are each day, so it helps. That helps the cause. Yeah. So are you? So, have you always been, from a risk taking standpoint, have, has it always been kind of in your blood, be willing to take risk? Um, I went from high risk to medium risk. Okay. You know, I'm not like crazy risk now. That's how I'd be doing acquisitions like crazy. Yeah. But no, I'm, right now I'm just I'm, I'm medium risk. Okay. So this is a risky business because of environmental. It's, you know, the things that we're going to have to do with the VOCs for the shredding, and that's going to be like $10 million to burden, you know, the VOCs off for EPA and stuff like that. It's, you know, there's other ways, you know, and I, that's why I've diversified so much. I've taken a lot of the money that we've made here and, and put it into different uh, different companies 
and um, that's really built up a lot is by yeah. diversifying what we do here. And was the purpose of that just because your interests expanded, or was it because you wanted to basically create a more sustainable, like, a sustainable business or sustainable? A little both. Or a little both, but I, you know, like the crypto mining is a big, uh, a big thing for us here. Yeah. And that is, you know, we have the, you know, we're tracking what we produce on the wall, but. Um, the crypto thing was just sort of like a, a modern day extension of the scrap business. We're actually mining something. We're not like crypto traders, you know, like yeah. day trading crypto. Mm -hmm. We just mine it 24 hours a day. And that's been a really huge part of our business. Good. Huge capital investment in these crypto oh, yeah. machines. It's a monster. Uh -huh. You know, you know, we're going to be running soon. I think we'll probably get up to like 20,000 machines. Oh, so wow. it's a big, it's a big, uh, it's a really big investment. Is the energy usage on that deal as much as like what, I mean, is it, is it as advertised? I mean, is it, is it pulling a lot of... Yes and no. I mean, the ones that were, since I've started it late to the game, uh -huh. um, the ones that now use less electricity than the other ones, okay. but the old ones were like, you know... Monsters when it comes to yeah, that. Yeah, and we're using right? renewable energy, so... Yeah, I remember, you, and I was reading through an article on that, and so when you say you're using re renewable en energy, like what is that? It's, a, it's a energy produced by either hydro or a solar. Okay. On top of the building? that. It, or yeah, but a lot of it is you're getting it from the utility. Oh, okay. So you're getting it in from the utility that way. Okay. So I had I had a question on here like that was kind of your big biggest, you know, business or personal failure that kind of you learned from. But I mean, I, for me, like I feel like you covered that. What about just on the business side? Um, they they kind of helped change... Is there something big that changed you, changed your attitude um, over and above, you know, different than the, you know, the deal in 96? Is there something that's really kind of, that sticks out to you that really has changed your attitude or changed anything? Or is it just kind of, this is, this is me? It's, it's been a it progression is. of stuff, but a lot of it, I think, was... Um kids play a role in that or is it i mean no i just think it's just like because i'm like a loner i'm like a hermit so it's not like i don't go home and discuss my work and stuff like that I, yeah I, I don't i don't bring that stuff home i just think a lot of it is um just morphing the company into something and, and staying relevant you know I, you gotta stay relevant in the industry yeah. you know, i don't do as much media stuff as i used to back in the day mm -hmm. a little more lower profile i i'm not on social media, but I mean in the, yeah, on the scrap, uh, scrap media. Yeah, and there's other people that are that have uh, taken over uh, and doing good stuff. I'm just trying to just do my thing here and uh, quietly build up a, a company. This thing's uh, with the crypto and with the other businesses. Um, it's into a decent company, so yeah. I'm pretty proud of everybody that's worked here. Yeah. Oh yeah, you got you have something to be very proud of. Trying hard, yeah. but it's, we're not done yet. We're getting there. We're yeah. it's one through ten. I'd say we're a seven. Okay, if I rate this company. One through ten, I'd say it's a six and a half to seven. A really highly profitable six and a half to seven. Yeah. Well, everybody's profitable now, so it's not like it's like everybody's. Doing I was pretty talking well now. that the other day too. Everybody's like, there's a bunch of scrap geniuses out there right now, right? I'm like, oh wait, you know that deal's coming. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you went through some of these turns, like the scrap genius turns into not as yeah. not as smart as the guy. Which, I mean, we've diversified ourselves, right? As well, like we. We do, uh, we have, you know, a pipe company and some other stuff, but it's just for that reason because we've been through those hard downturns where it's, where it's shit and it sucks. And so you got to find something to keep the machine running, keep the thing going when yeah. it's, and then kind of be able to shift the money either way to be able to kind of keep them all going yeah. and keep building. Because be careful feels, with that shifted money thing. That yeah, got, yeah, yeah, that got, that got me a year. Yeah. So I'm throwing out my FBI public service announcement is don't shift money. There you go. As a, we'll put it on the bottom. We'll, we'll That's my out. disclaimer. Yeah, we'll so. scroll it through. So I was listening to your podcast, uh, The Conversations at the Palace, right? Yeah. The, the, um, the guy that was the, about the restaurants. And in that, he talked, you know, he kind of asked you like, he kind of said a similar question, like, do you have any advice for anybody starting a restaurant or whatever? And you said, like, food costs, you know, watch your profit margins. Um, Pretty basic. Knowing your input costs, right? Yeah. And and I and that, to me, sounds like a scrap guy <laughs> that's yeah, starting it's, a restaurant, right? It's like, a, but it's the, same, it's the same. I mean, I think a lot of problem is people don't realize the cost. Well, it's hard today. Like, it's with the, with the fluctuation of fuel and labor it's hard to define your costs you know people yeah. are like oh it cost me this to bail you know you can ask four different people and there's uh -huh. a 15 dollars range of how much it costs to bail yeah so like 
you know, you got to just be careful because it's a margin. It's a small margin. Margins are better now, but it's a small margin business usually, especially yeah. for the cost of equipment. For what I put in this place in the in the in the uh, profit margin or the return on investment, yeah. you could be doing a lot of other stuff. You yeah, hundred percent. And especially, I feel like when especially when you run a shredder, right? Like yeah, shredders are a beast. They're bare. It's so. a. I mean, it's very margin driven. It's very like cost driven business where you have got to know. You were, you and I were having a conversation on I think a clubhouse one time, and you were basically like, the operations is like where you excel, right? Is because knowing your costs and and knowing how to dial and turn and like, and and basically kind of guide that, you know? Because yeah. with the shredder, it feels like there's so many moving parts. It's it's tough shredding. Well, shredding business is our best thing I think we do, mm -hmm. but it's really tough. And I'm not like a, a big mechanical engineer, so yeah. I'll reach out to other people for help and advice when it comes to the equipment. Yeah, I, to be honest, like I, I can't even change the oil in my truck. Yeah, I'm not the like best. I, that's not my. Uh, yeah, but then I'm I got, I'll find the guy that can do. The, yeah, that can do it. You know? Yeah, that's the key. It's just putting together the right team. Yeah. So. so how does a guy go from? Have you always had an interest in food, or has it you know from scrap to restaurants? I mean, has there always been like it was an itch you wanted to scratch, or did it just? kind of naturally come to I love that kind of business you know I, I love the food and entertainment business so okay. it was just some of the progression and those are all non-profit yeah so all those restaurants go to charity you know we're gonna have uh, by this year we'll have uh, six restaurants open so it's it's a it's a lot of work but I love the I love the restaurant so was the first one Krebs yes yeah so because I know the story but do you want to just kind of like yeah you know, just somebody came it. up to me on the street in the the Owners, somebody passed away. That restaurant's been there like a hundred years. Yeah. And uh, they came up and said, "Oh, you need to save this restaurant." So I didn't know what I was doing. So. Uh huh. You know, so. so you bought the, the building. Bought the building and, and the restaurant. The, yeah, and knocked it. down the restaurant, but I built it exactly how it looked, board for board. Yeah. So I took it down all the way and then rebuilt it so it looked exactly the same. And basically, just like structurally made it more sound and, and yeah. got it all fired up. Because I remember yeah. when you were opening it, um, and I was and I was listening. To this, you said you'd brought in like you know some pretty big time chefs yeah. and like really kind of like kicked it off and to get it get it going again. Yeah, it was good. It was it worked out good. And that's a busy restaurant. Like all the restaurants are busy, so Yeah. And are most of them in that uh, Skinny Atlas? Syracuse Skinny Atlas, yeah. yeah. They're all right, kind of mm -hmm. along. Yeah. And that, so I haven't been there, but I was I was asking Aaron on the way in. Um, I was like, is that worth going and like checking out as far as like, you know, go, go for a drive and like. It's a good thing that I drive. That's how I was going to see if you guys yeah. want to go up later. So yeah. Talk go, about that after this. Yeah. Thing. Go <laughs> check it out. So we talked about the crypto mining. Um, I, I got, I don't have a ton more questions for you, but you know, in that same podcast, you were talking about, you know, not necessarily the buying and trading and the NFTs and all that, but more on the, the, the property side, the metaverse side was kind of more your yeah. Your interest. So, not to go too deep into that, um, when are we going to have the first uh, Metaverse Scrapyard? <laughs> I think you'll have something like that in a year. Okay. Yeah, I think you'll have something really cool. But I also think that a lot of scrapyards will start paying in crypto. Yeah. I think that'll start next year. We're getting set up that we'll pay customers in crypto. So, we set that up for our uh, converter customers. Yeah, I, I saw that. Yeah. I think you were the first. Actually, I, I, I think you might have been the first in the world. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so you were way ahead of the curve. It, I do it on the retail level. It's a little harder. It's hard because it's smaller. Everybody has a wallet. Everybody everybody has a wallet. That. So, but that's something that I think um, we already had that in the planning stages. So it'll be it's it's going to be actually uh, uh, pretty simple for us to do. It's but soon it'll be everybody. You're going to be yeah a lot more you know you're going to be a lot more set up. You're going to be a lot more comfortable with the technology than a lot. And of we got a good are, team right? of crypto here because of the mining. Yeah. So it's not like a lot of scrapyards are like oh this is so crazy. Oh, yeah. But soon though you're going to be getting. I wouldn't be surprised if we get paid in the future by the mills in crypto too. Yeah, well, especially I, I, overseas. I mean, overseas you'll definitely be getting uh, money. You know, you won't have to do one hundred percent. And I feel like that's a good thing. Like, I know people are kind of like, uh, you know, it's the you unknown. Know. So I, I get the I get the the part of like I get the part of um, you know the the hesitation. Yeah, I'm hesitating. I'm hesitant, hesitant too. Like, put all this money in these mining machines, like. You know, I'm kind of, I'm definitely hesitant too. You know, about is this going to be good? Like, is it something that's real? But um, so far, so good. But well, at least I mean, it goes back to like, how do you know unless you try it? Like, how do you know? Yeah, but it's you, a like, big, but it's a big it's try. A big, it's yeah, a, big, it's a big, try, big try. But it know. goes back to your risk level and your your willingness to take some risk at the opportunity of, you know, being able to diversify yourself a little bit. But then yeah. also, just like you said, 
it also gives you that one we go back to all the way to speed and like what makes you competitive like if it takes you as a as an individual or private operator that long to I mean if you're quick to be able to pay you know crypto and do that I mean what about a publicly traded company in it you know it's got 10 20 accountants and this and they'll be able to do it Sims yeah. will be paying crypto they sometimes will, but absolutely can do it the quickest right and yeah it, but it's it, I mean I don't know if by doing it the quickest is going to have a big advantage I think the younger scrappers that come in the peddlers are going to love it the young yeah. kids but is it going to make a huge thing and uh, a play on business I don't think so no. but it just makes you relevant yeah, it's good PR. It's good that showing that you're progressive and uh, and you're and, learning the technology that's going to actually be in front of us. You yeah, know, you know, so more and more. At least day. we're going to be in, uh, on the forefront of it. So, I was. Um, have you ever watched anything on Netflix? A little. So, have you watched the new uh, Kanye West? Uh, that genius. Um, no. Okay, so no. I w- I watched the first. There two episodes on the airplane yesterday because that's the only time I have time to do shit. Like, right. oh, okay, I got three hours to kill, you know? So it's awesome. Yeah. It's worth a watch, right? And in that is his mom, uh, Mondo West, tells and Kanye, because he, he, he documented his whole life, right? And he's on, his, he's on the come up. He hasn't got signed by Rockefeller yet. Like, he's, he's about to. And she says to him, and I quote it because I love, I like a good quote, and she says, when a giant looks in the mirror, he sees nothing, right? Which basically is a way for her to say, like, you know, stay humble, right? Like, you can stand on the ground that everybody else is standing on, even though you you still stand way up here. Yeah. But it's kind of a way of, like, you know, keep growing, keep doing, yeah, but that's really cool. stay humble. Yeah. Like and his mom was, like, you know, I think she was kind of the rock that kind of held that deal yeah. together. He's and brilliant, too. He is. And that's why I was, like... the smartest like, people ever. And if you watch that, like you, if you don't like Kanye West or whatever, like it gives you kind of an appreciation for his hustle. Like that guy, yeah, that had, guy hustles. Uh, hustled his ass off to get even a break. Yeah, you know? I, agree. I agree. And so I was kind of, I heard that. I was thinking, I was thinking about you, and I was like, you know, like because you're a pretty humble guy, like you've, but you've you've reached heights that maybe most people wouldn't have thought that you would get to, you know, as a privately held like. You know, over here, balanced amongst the big boys, right? I don't know. I just don't. I just don't. I don't believe my hype too much. You know no, what I mean? I, I, I'm sitting home watching TV with the kids and stuff. I do epic stuff, but little bursts of it. So people think that like the epic stuff is every day. No, but I'll do like crazy stuff, like for two days, then go home and yeah. crazy stuff. But um, I just want to enjoy life. The keys being happy, and. Um, you know, the past couple of years, especially the past year, I think it's the happiest I've ever been just because I only do stuff that makes me happy. Yeah. I only employ people that make me happy. If my best guy doesn't make me happy, I severance him and, and um, we make a nice exit deal. And we talk and that's it because I want people to be happy that work here and I want to be happy with the people that work here. So it's a different strategy if, if you know, if I, I want a very drama-free workplace and, um, you know, Sadly, you know, some relationships haven't worked out just because, you know, I want to be happy. Yeah. So, like, my last question, and I'll, I'm done grilling you, okay. is the legacy. Like, what do you want your legacy to be, like, when it's all said and done and you, and not just in scrap, like, just whatever. Like, what, like, what's the, maybe in scrap, fuck it. Like, yeah, in scrap, scrap like, what do you, what do you want Scrap legacy be? is not important. There's a lot of guys that are going to have a better legacy in scrap than me, but, this, but the scrap industry has allowed me to do so much and help a lot of people. Uh-huh. I mean, for our size, we have to be one of the most philanthropic companies in the industry. I and mean, we're giving away millions and millions and millions of dollars here. Not like little, like yeah. we're crushing it and helping hundreds of charities. And um, I mean, daily, it's every day we're writing checks. And yeah. so I'm very thankful and blessed with scrap business because it's allowed me to help a lot of people. Um, again, people, everybody in the scrap industry is like, oh, they love it so much. I don't really love uh, my job, to be yeah. honest with you. Sometimes I hate my job in the scrap industry, but I always love what it's allowed me to do and help other people and to expand into other businesses, too. So this is the core, mm-hmm. and um, I'll always be in the scrap business. But, um, I mean, I talk to people every day, and they're like, oh, I love getting up and doing the scrap thing. Yeah. And yeah, it's, uh, it's, so you're, a tough, it's a tough gig. I mean, 100%. Sleeping, sleeping three hours a night is brutal. So the legacy is is the give back? Yeah, I think the le- legacy is the give back, and the legacy is what we can do for the small communities that we're in. Mm-hmm. And I want to make this a really environmentally compliant 
to the craziest stage facilities. So I think that's what my legacy will be is like making really like a moral, ethical, safe for the employees and environmentally friendly places that are above the norm. But other than that, it's, that's, that's, and you're going to enjoy your life. Yeah, enjoy life. And I'm, I'm, I'm living the best life. I, who would ever thought like I, I get to do some really cool stuff and I got to meet some really cool people yeah. in, in the industry, outside the industry. So, um, just thankful. I just appreciate everything. You know, it's, I guess, you know, when I was on a top bunk in prison, coming to here, you know, coming to where I am now, it's, uh, it's been a crazy road, but I wouldn't, I, you know, I wouldn't, it's just, it's just your path, you know? It's you. At the end of the day, it's, 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 it's you. That's, like that's me or, you know, and I don't yeah. really, I don't really care if people like me or not. It's not like, uh, people like, the, like if somebody says, oh, in the scrap industry, like, I don't really care. Yeah. You know, I don't, this isn't, this is my, uh, scrap persona. And then when I go home, I'm a totally different person. It's like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. I'm like quiet. It. I'm quiet when I get out of here. Yeah. And I've had to defend a small company against big companies. So I'm always going to be, I always would have to be the bad guy because I always had to, when your back's against the wall, you always had to fight back. Yeah, and, but I mean, know, and, and just, that's it. It's I'm that underdog, fight. an underdog mentality that you're able to just go out and, and get it done. Yeah, and, and you know, and you, you, you got to get it done. There's just no mm-hmm. excuse. There's no, you know, when you have no plan B, you, you got to make it happen yourself. And uh, I'm not, I don't believe, I'm not going to be crying or complaining or bitching. It is what it is. And I just, you got to make it, you got to make it happen. And sadly, though, when you're working this hard, you know, people are always going to think in the industry, oh, there's got to be a shortcut. There's mm. got to be something. No. The shortcut is fucking three hours of sleep at night. Yeah, the like, shortcut is just getting beat up. I mean, it's. Every this day, this shit's, beat, this shit's beat up. Yep. I'm at the shredder. I'm not at like so I'm not in some like, you know, I'm at the production facility. So we just had an explosion yeah. right here. Yeah. You know, it's like uh, this is I'm I'm in the trenches here. There's no and, shortcut. Uh, like, to, but I get it. I get it. people like this. Like, well, how's he doing it? No, because I just don't want to quit. You yeah. know, and it just that's it. I just don't want to quit. There's no secret. I wish I had some secrets like to share. I wish yeah. I had, you know, be sometimes back in the day, I wish I had the secret Sims partner or the uh, secret yeah. partner of uh, somebody, but that you could be like, Hey, send money. But to be honest, like, I don't think any of them wanted to be my partner anyway. So it's not like, you know, they're probably smart back then. Yeah. They're probably actually a good call. Yeah. Well, maybe not now. Cause the company's really good, but yeah. back then they're probably smart not to be my partner. All right, man. Thank you again. Yeah, thanks, appreciate, you. Good seeing you. I appreciate yeah, you too. Likewise. Good seeing you.